now on nurses. The fire brigade are called to the children's ward. There's a bit of a hitch in theatre and the importance of work at the hospital mortuary. It's a year since Christine Duval donated one of her kidneys to husband Richard, whose own kidneys were in terminal failure. Both recovered quickly, but Chris has been suffering discomfort and pain due to some deep stitching. Her own operation involved the removal of a rib, which was standard practice at that time, a procedure which has since been rethought and abandoned. I was talking to Mr Lear and he said that for future operations he's not taking the rib out, um, as that seems to cause the major, the major problems with people. So hopefully other people will be, <laughs> will be fine. I haven't noticed any difference having just one kidney. I mean, it, it hasn't made any difference to me at all. I'm incredibly fit. And, and I say once this problem is sorted out, I shall be, you know, back on the badminton court and carrying out life normally. But for Richie, the transplant which Chris made possible has been truly life-changing. I can't tell you how well I feel. I never, ever felt, never, ever thought that I would feel this good at, at 58 years old. I, I, it's, I'm floating on cloud nine, really, because it, I'm so well, so incredibly well. I feel better. I mean, before I had the transplant and before I went on dialysis even, I was tired. I was a bit headachy, I was lethargic, and I felt old. And within probably a month of the transplant, I, I was much, much better than I had been for probably several years. And I don't think I realised how much my general performance and well-being was degraded. But it took quite some time for Richie to come to terms emotionally and psychologically with the implications of a live donation by Chris. I still felt very guilty and, and one day I was talking to one of my, my wife's friends and she said to me that had I refused to accept the donation of kidney it would have been very selfish because Chris's quality of life was, was being affected obviously quite badly by, by my condition. And since then it, it sort of changed my, my mind process, changed the mindset I suppose. And I've been perfectly okay with it since. Obviously, I've been a bit unhappy about Chris's discomfort, uh, but fortunately, they've now decided that the stitches might be causing a problem. So hopefully, this is going to sort it out. Julie Player's back at home now after an attempt to correct her short-sightedness by laser surgery. So far, it's not been a great success. She's very dependent on her sons, Tom and Ben. Ben's been really good, helping me out. This <laughs> invalid mother. <laughs> I've not got any pain at all. My eyes feel really comfortable, which is the good thing, but the not so good thing is I cannot see. He's with it. She's a bit angry at it. Do you take sugars? No sugar. They kept reiterating that I shouldn't expect 20 20 vision, which I absolutely didn't, you know, and I wouldn't expect. I understood all that, but equally, I did expect to be able to see a lot better than I can see now. And I've got one eye that's markedly worse than the other. That is in itself quite disorientating. I'm very upset about it. I'd say I really didn't want to go off sick from work. It's one of the things I really didn't want to do. We haven't got that many nurses, so I, I feel bad in that respect. And considering it wasn't an essential um, life-threatening operation, it was a thing that I wanted, that makes it even worse, really. The relative tranquility of daily life on the Barbara Russell Children's Ward is about to be disrupted in a big way. Senior staff nurse Janet Bowen is briefing her colleagues about patients on the ward, but she's also preparing them for a full-on emergency drill. We plan to evacuate about 50 people. Um, there's about 15 patients at the moment, plus relatives, plus ancillary staff. There's also doctors on the ward, um, domestics and various people that work in the offices upstairs. Parents with very sick children are already anxious for their little ones, so Janet's been careful to involve the mums and dads so they don't become too alarmed. They have a lot of trauma to go through at the moment. Their children are very sick, and I think it was best that we just told them sort of the last hour, um, and then we've explained everything to them, what's going to happen, and that when the alarms go off, we will coordinate. This drill is intended to be as close to reality as possible, so the local fire brigade are also joining the exercise. 
They've arranged to place two dummy casualties in a side ward which has been filled with real smoke. Um, we've already had two small fires on the unit um, when the unit first opened and um, things went slightly wrong but we learnt from it and this will be a good exercise today to show how we've learnt from the past experiences. Yeah, all the walking out first and yeah. then we'll take Lydia And we're all clear this end as well, OK? So you'll make your way out now? Right. As the fire brigade arrives, literally everyone is evacuated, even if they're bed-bound. So covered up. The firemen have to be fully equipped for a real situation and wearing their masks, and the fire incident commander needs to establish the plan of action with the hospital's clinical site manager. Just confirm that. It's that door there. That'll yeah. take us into that one. Michelle Lancaster's married to Steve and has a two-year-old daughter, Amy. Michelle made a dramatic career change a few years ago by coming to work for the North Bristol NHS Trust after being a Butlin's red coat. Wow. You don't know who it is, do you? Do you think it's Mummy? I'd never actually ever in my whole life imagined working in a mortuary. Um, I saw the job advertised in one of the local newspapers. I think probably... You know, it was nosiness that got the better of me because at the end of the advert they said, you know, phone up and come along and have an informal chat, you know, come and see what we do. And I came down, we actually sat in the mortuary about three hours just chatting and I thought, oh, that would be a really great job to do. A recent tragedy has added even more meaning to Michelle's job as a mortuary technician. My own mum actually passed away in December of last year, which was a very traumatic thing to have to go through. She was only very young herself, she was only 48 unfortunately when she died. Um, it has changed the way I see my job a lot, uh, really from the point of view of seeing relatives. I now can appreciate what they're going through and I always thought I was compassionate and sympathetic and, you know, and trying to be as understanding as I possibly could. Although it sounds awful, you can't fully appreciate what people are going through until you've been through it yourself. And it's made me care about my job a lot more. Should we give Daddy one? I just find it's really important to really appreciate everything that you've got every day. And I just really do count my blessings, you know, when I go home see my little girl. And, you know, because I've seen people who've gone through, you know, something that's so tragic. And it's certainly brought it home to me exactly how important life is. What's that? House. What noise do horses make? Me. My other half's actually a funeral director, which really does help because when you go home, uh, most couples, the first thing that you talk about is, I did this, this, this and this today. And I think if Steve wasn't a funeral director, it would probably worry him slightly, some of the things that I have to do. Um, because he's involved in the business, it, it, really, it really helps because at least you can get it off your chest to somebody who understands exactly where you're coming from. It's lovely, love of my life. Find him in a mortuary, very strange. <laughs> At the children's ward, the fire crew's organising how best to deal with the theoretical fire. Logistically not so easy as there's quite a long set of corridors to bring the fire hoses through. ...to uh, manoeuvre the hose wheel around through all the self-closing doors, over. With a hose extension attached, they're now ready to tackle the next task, rescuing two casualties in one of the side wards. The smoke is pretty dense, and it's a ward full of furniture and equipment, so it's not going to be that easy for them, which is the point of the exercise for the fire crew. Are you going to take that, uh, that casualty? 12.28 over. Yeah, we're now breaking off comms to bring the casualty out, over. You know what the um, control in front of the casualty, yeah? I've told them already, yeah. I don't know, I see that. This is three-year-old Murren, first child to Sarah and Paul, who only eight months ago lost their newly arrived second baby daughter, Cameron. She passed away only 36 hours after coming home from hospital. Sarah had gone to bed exhausted after the emotional and physical strain of delivering her baby, and Paul noticed that the baby monitor had become completely silent. When Paul went up to, to check on her and the monitor was um, 
it's gone quiet. It's just really just wished that I'd been with there. Turned up at Southmead Hospital, A&E department, they took us right into a back room um, where we were told that they were very sorry but Cameron had died. You just, you just can't believe it's happened really. And, and of course it's all the, if there, if there is it's something you didn't do or didn't do, it could have changed the outcome. That's, that's kind of whizzing through your mind. It was after this dreadful event that mortuary technician Michelle became very involved in Paul and Sarah's grief. I like to be seen by relatives because I like to tell them that, you know, my name's Michelle, I'm here to look after, you know, your mum, your dad, your baby, your granddad, whoever it may be within the family. You know, this is what I'm here to do. And yes, it is my job, but it's also a job that I really care about and want to do well for them. All sorts of things go through your mind to start off with. I think we hadn't long painted um, painted our, our bedroom and it's things like, you know, was it paint fumes or something like that? The easiest person to blame is yourself at the end of the day. But it's very natural and it's, you know, it's all part of the grieving process. I had never, until that point in time, had anything to do with a mortuary, with a chapel of rest, anything else. I had never even gathered that we could go back in and see Cameron. Um, and Michelle made it quite clear at that point in time that we could go in as often as we wanted until the, the funeral. And we went in every day. But in that time, Michelle was a person that we had 95% of contact with, um, that would sit there, talk us through what we were going through. Um, our own mother had actually died only two months beforehand. Um, so she had recent experience of somebody dying and she would be able to tell you through first-hand experience, well, that's natural. She would do a very caring job, and that just seems to be, it just seems to sum her up. Obviously, my main job is to make sure that the baby looks as lovely as it possibly can, because at the end of the day, it's mummy and daddy who are coming, and the time that they've got with a little one is relatively short compared to what they were hoping it was going to be. She always made sure that Cameron was dressed correctly, and that um, she was in the, the Moses basket, it was actually a, a swinging cradle. Anything that we were going to put in the coffin was always in that Moses basket when we went in there. Obviously that was being used by other people, so Michelle must have been preparing that and uh, making sure it was all right for, for us coming in to see, to see Cameron. She's so affectionate and just so... Um really bubbly and she's just for the circumstances um, she, she didn't make you feel rushed and it's just the way you felt that um, you know she was sort of when we weren't there for instance sort of you know, looking after Cameron and, and um, just sort of carrying on sort of treating Cameron with you know, respect and care I think that's what it was. I mean I tend to often say it's like nursing only you know, just because they're not living and breathing and speaking doesn't mean that they don't need to be looked after. And the same as their relatives, you know, they're still here. They still need somebody who's going to be there behind the scenes, making sure that everything happens the way it should for them. To go and see a, a little person who's, who's just died, who's only lived for 36 hours, and that's all the time you've actually spent with them, being able to spend time over the next um, almost two weeks with them even an hour and a half a day, it's almost like spending the same rest of their life again with them. We just took it all a stage at a time. Our three-year-old would come in, she would draw pictures, and, you know, the, the, there are pictures that Murren drew when she was in there that are actually in Cameron's coffin. <laughs> It's time now for Chris Duval to go to theatre for a minor operation to remove the troublesome internal stitch. She's about to be briefed by consultant vascular surgeon Paul Lear. Basically, I'll make a cut at the front end of the wound and the back end of the wound, mm -hmm. and we'll go right down. I'll see if I can get all the stitch out, all right. part of it, okay. and then we'll close the wound up again with some local anaesthetic mm -hmm. in it, and you should be able to get away in three or four hours' time. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Good. So. I'll see you, you won't see me. <laughs> While Chris is being anaesthetised, there's a bit of a problem for Paul Lear. What has happened there? Now, 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 don't film this. This is a panic time. <laughs> All right, you're going to go now. Yeah, let's get the roll. I'll just see if it's there. I can't believe this. 
That is um, something tantamount to a disaster. The screw falling off from my pocket. Now this could be a very interesting morning. I have got some others actually. Mm. Well, well, well. We're at engineering when I need them. They've got a magnetic roller in theatre to try and find the small screw which has fallen out of Paul's spectacle frame. Uh, that may be a good idea. Or it's actually a piece of a strong uh, string would probably do the job, wouldn't it? If you look at it together... Or piece of it. And then it's got two. Look at this. Clearly, surgical suturing skills can be useful in all sorts of situations. That's it. Running repairs. Super. <laughs> Surgeon is happily restored to operative capability. Back at the children's ward, the fire drill's coming to an end, and the dummy casualties have been successfully rescued. As the firemen pack up their equipment, the staff, patients and relatives can make their way back onto the ward. I think it went very well. Um, we were just saying we evacuated the ward very quickly. Um, everybody was OK. We had counted for everybody and within a few minutes the ward was clear. And, um, I think we're very pleased. It seems the drill has been quite an enjoyable distraction for most on the ward, and the firemen have attracted a few fans. Meanwhile, Janet and her colleagues seem pleased with the exercise. Yeah, it did, didn't it? Yeah, we were just saying about that. The kitchen door was OK. Well, technically, we wouldn't come back in, would we? As you can see, we've some ideas have already come up, um, and we should take these forward and look at them and see where we can improve with these as well. After the initial drama of breaking his glasses, Paul's now ready to carry out a quick operation to remove the deep stitches which are the probable cause of Chris's discomfort. This stitch is, I think, irritating one of the nerves that comes around to supply the muscles and the skin of the flank and it gives her a lot of pain when she twists and turns. So once we take the stitch out, the pain should go and that should be the end of it. Go for it. Have you got the second clip? We can pull on both ends then. Okay, uh, the second... Although it wasn't the cause of her pain, the removal of a rib prior to taking out a healthy kidney for live donation is now thought to make recovery slower and more painful and Paul's decided to abandon that practice. I attended a meeting earlier this year where there's quite good evidence that if you remove a rib you get much more pain in the wound and uh, other, other centres have stopped removing the rib and have had no problems with pain at all, so it's quite easy to make the decision. This is a very simple procedure and the operation's quickly completed with Chris's internal stitches removed. Right, that'll be it then, a little bit of brown stuff. At the mortuary and Chapel of Rest, Michelle is quite convinced by the importance of a full post-mortem and, perhaps surprisingly, the comfort such a procedure can give to the bereaved. It's nice to be able to say to relatives, sometimes when we do post-mortems, we can find out things that can reassure them that it wasn't their fault and hopefully that puts their mind to rest sometimes. I knew that that was why it had to be done, the baby or anybody dies unexpectedly. Obviously we wanted to know why and, and, and anything that could lead to that, but there's also um, obviously you know, see a little baby thinking, you know, what they're going to do. Um. There is no way that, that we would have stopped a postmortem. It was essential, the postmortem. I don't think that can be that can be stressed enough. If we hadn't found out there was a one in four chance of this happening again, um, then we'd have been in a position that we could have went for another child, the other child died, and we would have been blaming ourselves even more and saying, well, what is it that we're doing? You know, what, what is it we're doing wrong? It makes a big difference. There's nothing you can reproach yourself with. You don't think anything's going to go wrong. Obviously, if you'd known that was going to go wrong, you would have perhaps spent more time sort of cuddling her and 
obviously but that's all that's hindsight for you you know but at the end of the day yeah there's nothing we could have done to have altered altered events so that does it does make it does make a big difference since the postmortem was done we have moved on a lot because we've had the satisfaction that we know there's nothing we could have done to help Cameron. We know the reason why she died, and we know the impact it would have on future children. Uh, we also have found out since that the reason why she died will not impact on Warren, unless Warren meets somebody with the same genetic disorder, which was known as complex one deficiency. If the postmortem hadn't been carried out, we wouldn't have known why Cameron died. We'd have assumed it was a caught death. We're a very, very close team here at Southmead. There are times when you do get very upset by what you see. And if we've had a, a particularly bad experience, um, the three of us will probably have a little cuddle, especially with baby deaths. And sometimes, as a mum, you, really, you can really feel for these people that you're seeing, and you can't change it for them but hopefully you can make it slightly easier. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. Next on Nurses. Just, just a sharp scratch and a bee sting, OK, so it's not coming now. Oh, sorry. Oh. He's 53.7. Okay. He's a good boy. 39.1. That me or pain in your tummy? Me. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite important that we know how you're doing. Unfortunately, you're going to be in hospital for about a week. If you look at the top of his head, you mm. see it's sort of um, kind of squashed that way. We're probably aim to get at least four good contractions every 10 minutes. Yeah. I'm sure they'll get stronger. <laughs> He will. <laughs> but there's, there's absolutely no excessive enlargement of the fluid uh, in, the, in the brain. It's, just, it's all brain. Yeah. Growing very nicely there. Good. Brilliant. Good job. Click on screen for more videos of extraordinary humans.